We had a traffic report in the first session of the conference about the traffic getting here. I didn't see any traffic at all because I came across the sea and it took about 29 hours door to door. So stop complaining about the traffic on highway, whatever number it was. Um, <laughs> it was really, really good. Why did that go backwards? Um, okay, so let's focus. For the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about some of the results from the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health. We began the study in 1996. We recruited more than 40,000 women randomly from across Australia. They live in the postcode codes marked by these dots, which is roughly where everyone lives in Australia. The study is planned to go for 20 years. We're up to year number 19, which makes me feel incredibly old and um, just um, perfect for a conference on ageing. And it's a study about women's health. It's not about physical activity. It's about everything about health. But my little bit of it is about health. And there's actually about 500 papers published from the study of the 70 are on physical activity and weight. Um, but the others are on all kinds of other things. We recruited three cohorts. This is the tricky bit. The young ones were 18 to 23 when we started. Um, they're now 37 to 42, so we've tracked them through their 20s and 30s. The middle age group, 45 to 50, they're now 64 to 69. The older ones were 70 to 75, they're now, the remaining ones, <coughs> are 89 to 94. So we've got three cohorts aging in tandem. All surveyed in 1996 and then at three year intervals on a rolling basis. Don't worry about the numbers. This is just to show you in this middle group I'll talk about today. Um, started at 45 to 50. We've lost some over time, as you might expect. And the last survey was 2013. And the older group, 70 to 75, through to 2011. And then we stopped surveying them by mail. And we started to telephone them instead every six months, which we've been doing ever since. So we have this enormous data set on the healthy ages, the ones who are still with us after 20 years. We asked about physical activity. All the surveys are self-reported. We use our Active Australia measure, which asks about time spent walking and in moderate and vigorous activity. And we weight the times by um, met values to get a score in met minutes per week. We measure sitting time using a measure similar to that used in the IPAC study or our own measure which has five domains of sitting time but the older women find it very hard to estimate sitting time so I'm not going to talk a lot about the sitting time in the, in the older women. Some limitations up front. It is a study of women who agreed, they were randomly selected but the ones who agreed to be in the study, of course, so they are biased. They are more healthy, more wealthy, more wise than the average Australian woman. But because of the large sample size, they are pretty representative of Australian women today. And of course, the data are self-reported, but we do link to their health records so we can validate. And these women are pretty smart. You ask them what's wrong with them and check their health records, they're pretty right. If you've had a hysterectomy, you know, and you report it 100% right. Heart, at heart attacks, not so clever. Some think they have and maybe. Diabetes, yes, well, I had it last year, but I don't have it now. <laughs> well, because I take medication now, so I don't have it anymore. So it's tricky with self-report, but we try to validate wherever we can. So physical activity, we're talking about physical activity here. What do we know? Well, these are US data from Bill Haskell. We know that physical activity goes down across the age span, and we know the biggest drop is here in young adulthood, and then it just kind of goes down to what you in America call 65 plus. That's actually before we started our older cohort. So um, there aren't very many data um, much beyond that in, on, in a national sense. So that same line is shown here. That's the US line. Um, going across here, and this is our young cohort, and they're following pretty much what happens over here. I'm um, not going to talk about them. I'm going to talk about the middle age group, because this is kind of aging, although they were around 50 when we started. And they're bucking the trend. They're going up, which is kind of a bit of a shock, because people say physical activity is not changing. And if you just plotted physical activity from 18 to 90, you'd see the same kind of pattern here. 
but for getting this blip in the middle. So let's have a look at this <coughs> middle age group. Um, 10,694 of them across these four data sets. And the proportion who were meeting guidelines, that is doing the 150 minutes a week of at least moderate activity, um, was here in 1996 and gradually creeping upwards. Now think about what happens in that time between 45 and 50 to around age 65. Why would physical activity be going up? Well, it's not as straightforward as it seems. In 2001, 47% were active, that's the light green. The dark color is inactive. At the next survey, some of those active ones had become inactive, and some of the inactive ones had become active. So it's not a straight increase of a few more <coughs> becoming active. There's changing over. Active become inactive, and inactive become active, the other way around. And the same thing happens again. So some of the active ones become inactive, some of those inactive ones become active. So we get this changing over at each survey, so by the end, it looks like this. Now, the statisticians in the audience are going to say, this is all random error. This is rubbish. This is measurement error. And I'm sure the guys who were speaking yesterday would say, you know, you can't measure it that accurately. And um, this kind of pattern on the right-hand side shows that your, me your measure is at fault. But interestingly, when you look at what predicts these changes for activity either going up or down, it's quite interesting. And the overall trend in this middle cohort, oh, sorry, I'll just tell you, 22% were active at every survey, and 17% were inactive at every survey, and everyone else was changing in and out. And some of the things associated with increasing physical activity in mid-age will not surprise you. The most important one was retirement. So when the women retired from paid jobs, they became more active. Associated with that was usually a decrease in income, but they still became more active, so they didn't need extra money to join the, the golf or tennis club. This is a bit sad. Um, death of spouse or partner is associated with increasing physical activity, and we see this in the young women as well and in the older women. And it's probably because these women have been caring for a sick partner for some time, and now they have more time. And the other one, of course, is the children leaving home. What better way to have more time than getting rid of the kids? So, ladies, you want to become more active, you retire, get rid of the husband, get rid of the children. You can do whatever you like. Um, you can go and walk when you like. You don't have to plan anyone else's meals. You can just do it all your own way. So the data do kind of make sense. Um, that's the middle age group. Now, the older age group, they're... Um, tracking downwards in physical activity, as you might expect. And I think there are very few data sets in the world following the same women from their 70s into their 90s. And in this case, the, the data, are obviously, it's, it's going down. But the same thing is true with the mixing and matching of um, inactive and active. So the patterns look something like this. They're becoming overall less active, so the purple bars are becoming bigger but there's a lot of change going on. There's a big block of, um, a small block of active at every survey and a much larger group who are inactive at every survey. Remember, there were 70 when we started. Um, and these are the same women followed over time, so not including the ones who've died. Um, and the life events associated with decreasing physical activity are overwhelmingly to do with health. So when the women are diagnosed with a major illness, they become less active. If they recover, they become more active. And then if they're diagnosed again, they become less active. Injury or surgery, most likely hip replacements and knee replacements, um, they become less active for a while. But then they become absolutely less active when they move from their homes into an institution. And that's really sad because the institutions probably should be doing something to keep them active, but unfortunately most of them are not. So the data do make sense. The life events um, seem to mirror very closely the changing patterns in physical activity. So what about sitting time? Well, in middle age, um, we've got a lot of working women in this cohort of 14,000, a lot of nurses, a lot of teachers. You may think nurses and teachers are on their feet all day, 
I can tell you from accelerometer studies, they are not on their feet all day. They are sitting for 66% of their day. So that's the middle age group. And the older women, the older they become, the more they sit. Sitting time by our measure, this is using our five item measure, so it asks about sitting in different domains. It's very variable and it depends on life circumstances, on the work that's done, the commute time, um, all kinds of different factors. But you can see it's trending vaguely upwards, but not really much change in middle age, highly variable. These are data from um, one of my post docs last year, Bronwyn Clark. And we like to think about sitting as not changing much in retirement for women. I don't know what happens in men. Um, maybe they're more active, maybe they're not, um, because we don't have data in men. So what are the health effects of moving and sitting? Very complicated, using prospective time lag models, where physical activity at one survey predicts a health outcome at the next survey continually over time. I don't do this, my postdocs do it, it's very complicated work. Some of the things we've been looking at um, in the mid-age group, what's important, is it walking, moderate, vigorous activity, or all three? And these are some lovely data from Christy Heesh, who worked with me a few years ago, um, looking at physical activity and vitality. So it's not all bad news in ageing, as we heard in the, the lecture yesterday, um, sorry, the day before. So this is the relationship between the vitality score in the SF36 and on the left is total activity um, increasing across here and you see this beautiful relationship um, between incre increasing higher physical activity at one time predicting higher vitality at the next survey across this time period 2001 to 2007. And when Christy looked at the women who only walk, so that they only report walking as their physical activity, the relationship is not quite so strong. It's a bit wobbly in here. But you can see the same trend. And for meeting guidelines, which is about this point here, it's pretty much the same, a bit more variable here. But there are advantages of just walking for these mid-age women. And this isn't new. The nurses' study showed this years before we did. Looking now at one of the things where the curve goes the other way, so this is physical activity and incident depression in the mid-age group from 1998 to 2012. This is some work from another one of my postdocs, Toby Pavey. He looked at those who did walking and moderate activity only, and then another group that matched this time on volume of activity, but those who reported any vigorous activity. And you can see the, the odds ratio, sorry, is, where's that gone? Um, the odds ratios are lower for those who report any vigorous activity. Now, the statisticians here will say yes, but these are overlapping, and yes, they are until we get right over here. But you can see there's it's roughly a 15% benefit from doing some vigorous activity. And this has been replicated recently in another study from the University of Sydney. So we think that there's some benefits to doing vigorous activity in middle age. What about the older age group? Um, this one is physical activity and arthritis. These are, um, again, um, analyses done by Christy Heesh for total activity on the left, um, showing as physical activity increases, incidence of arthritis decreases. This is in three-year time blocks from one survey to the next. And for walking, I always say Christy made this up because it's a perfect straight line. And we, we don't often see these uh, data looking like this, but you can see very clearly that um, even quite low, sorry, I'm not very good at this, quite low levels of physical activity, 180 to 300 minutes a week, that's half the guidelines, is giving you um, some benefit there in just walking. This is the point where you would be meeting guidelines and this is more activity again. And you can see this beautiful um, risk reduction. And of course, heart disease, diabetes, all the things you know about as well um, show similar patterns. For mental health, this is a measure called the geriatric anxiety and depression scale with our older women. In this case, the 
um, odds ratios for walking are put side by side with those for total physical activity and you can see there's really not much difference. So if you're doing very low levels of activity, whether it's mixed activity or just walking, you get a reduction in incident anxiety and depression scores even from very low levels of physical activity. Someone this morning, can't remember which one of you maybe, Maybe you said the dose, something about the dose should be lower for older people, and I think these data are um, showing that we can see substantial benefits from fairly low levels of physical activity with older women in their 70s. Physical activity and mortality follows the, the curve. Most of you have seen this many times before in, in reports from your own <coughs> guidelines, Ken Powell's work. The graphs he produces look very much like this. And the important point is that the relative risk of dying over, the, over this 10-year um, period from age 73 to 83, um, the biggest risk reduction is between doing something and doing nothing. And you probably all knew that anyway. And we get this nice curve. It's a pity about that one, but um, this always happens in, 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 with real data. Um, but again, you can see quite large risk reductions with low levels of physical activity in this older age group, so 73 to 78 through to 83 to 88. Now, what about sitting? We've heard an awful lot about sitting in the media the last two years, the evidence on um, sitting, sedentary time. I like to call it sitting time because I'm not talking about lying down and going to sleep, but sitting time. Um, sitting and mortality, these are data from our older age group. We can see that um, the relationship's pretty flat from low levels of sitting through to five or six, maybe seven hours per day. And then the risk of death, this is the risk of death between these ages. There were 2,003 deaths in this initial cohort. And the risk increases quite markedly with high levels of sitting. And we've seen this time and again with studies from around the world. And you'll see in nearly all the reports in all the papers a little line in the description of the analysis that says adjusted for physical activity. And so physical activity level is put into the modelling and this is what results after adjustment. Now, there's been huge debate recently about whether the effects of sitting are independent of the effects of physical activity. And there are lots of groups around the world who are really looking at this now in quite a lot of detail. And Toby has allowed me to show you these data, but they're not published yet. But I think they're typical of what we're going to see um, coming out fairly soon. Now, this is a, a little complicated. So I, hope, uh, I hoped it would grow line by line, but it didn't. But let's go through it slowly. So we have sitting time on this x-axis. And this is in quintiles. So we've got the lowest sitting, the next, the next, the next, and the highest sitting. And on this axis, back to front, no physical activity, low physical activity, moderate, and high. And these are met hours per week. So 10 met hours per week is about meeting guidelines, which sits somewhere in this group here. So this is less than guidelines. This is doing nothing. This is um, high levels of physical activity. In fact, very high for this age group. And if we focus on this very high level of physical activity, it's about an hour a day, five days a week. Compared with the ones who do no sitting, that's the reference category, there's not much effect of sitting if you are highly active. And this is coming out in more and more studies around the world. The second level, again, there's no significant effect of sitting across, there's no significant effect across sitting time if you're meeting physical activity guidelines. However, if you're doing less physical activity, you start to see it's the blue bars here, this increase. So if you're doing low levels of physical activity and sitting more than eight hours, your risk of death is increased. And there's lots of other health outcomes that are being looked at with this same kind of modeling now, particularly heart disease and diabetes. And you can see in the back row, that's of course the low physical activity group, 
the risks from sitting are pretty much across the board, but very marked from six, eight, ten hours per week. So it would seem to me, from having seen quite a lot of data sets, not just this one now, that we, we've tended to grab the sitting time evidence and say, all you have to do is stand up. And we've forgotten that the effects of physical activity are much, much greater. So if we, if we just go back to um, this graph, we see this risk reduction in these older women from one down to 0.6, let's say, with low levels of physical activity, is a huge risk reduction from low levels of physical activity. But if you look at the sitting time graph, you've got to go a long way across here before you see quite small increases in risk from sitting. So when you put the two together, I think they, they actually do inter intertwine. But um, the, the jury's still out on that one. <coughs> so finally, I hope there's a finally. <laughs> um, this is my absolutely favorite story from the long study so far. And this is some nice work done by postdoc Geska Peters, who came from the Dutch group to work with us a few years ago. And this is looking at physical activity, sorry, physical functioning across the lifespan in the three cohorts. So I'll take you through this one slowly. This is the physical function score of the SF36 on this axis, and this is age from 20 to 90. This line represents the score which equates with the time when women need help with activities of daily life. So if you score less than 61 in, on this scale in our population, you need help with activities of daily life. So anything above that score is commensurate with, with good physical functioning. So if we look at the lowest quintile, so the bottom 20% of physical activity, in the young women, so the young women were, let's say, 20 to 40, we can see that physical function is already declining, albeit slowly. Through middle age, the decline continues till about 60 and then kind of dips. We don't have these data yet. It's a different group. By the age of 70, those who are in the lowest quintile of physical activity are already at the disability threshold and they continue downwards. Now, if we compare that with the women who are in the top quintile, the top 20% of physical activity, we can see that in the young age group, they're tracking pretty parallel, but at a higher level. In middle age, it's starting to diverge here. We're not seeing this same big drop off after age 60. And from age 70, this is exactly as Anne Newman said on what day was that? Thursday. Um, what day is it? Um, she said these, these lines track in parallel, and our data is showing the same thing. So being active doesn't help with the decline, but it certainly helps with the starting point. So these are the top 20%. And we can see they don't reach this disability line until about age 84. So my take on this is that if we can intervene in these years, and get more women, and presumably men if the, if the same holds true, if we can get more of the population to be up here during this time, then we should be able to get 14 extra years of healthy life, which means fewer pharmaceuticals, fewer hospital visits, 14 years of healthy life by getting people to move from there to there in middle age seems to be a pretty good buy and it's something that I use all the time now when I'm saying this is why we do what we do because these are, these are the sorts of things we can show. So I'll leave it there and let you, I'll just see the pictures of the people who do this so myself and Annette Dobson try to orchestrate the thing but the people who do the work are the postdocs and they're shown there. Thank you.